Jim was just very active. He loved to be outdoors. He wanted to be doing stuff. As a kid, he had asthma. He would get horrible attacks and we'd have to take him to the hospital. My first nine, ten years of life were full of asthma and hospitalization and asthma attacks and it really slowed me down. But as he got older, he overcame that, outgrew it, and then you couldn't stop him. He just wanted to play baseball, be outside, swimming. He loved to swim and just anything and everything. He wanted to be strong. Check this one out. I was a big runner. It was like an addiction. I would always find time to run outside unless it was crazy cold conditions. In the summer, of course, I'd run even more, run in, in, in the forests with my friends and my, my uncle, big into uh, hiking, bicycling. I'd, I'd bicycle every chance I, I, I got, weather permitting. When he had this opportunity to move out to California, it was just to to take advantage of the 12 months a year kind of lifestyle where he could be outside. It was a bold move for our family because we mostly all stayed here where we were born and raised in Chicago. But then when he got out there and we saw him, he just was so healthy looking. It was so good for him. Living in Chicago, I never even saw the ocean. Then to go from that to living I was just a few blocks from the Pacific Ocean, just, I don't know, it just blew my mind, and I, I loved every, every minute of it. There was like a physical change. He kind of glowed, and he was exercising and doing a lot of outdoor activity, and it was like this transformation. <laughs> just about a month and a half before the accident, he sent Joe and me uh, this two-page letter thanking us what we did for him and you know he loves the life he had. It's dated March 13th, 2014. He says, Mom, Pop, don't overthink. I don't think about you every day because I do. I would have never found a, such a success in life without your guidance and support. I wrote him a letter just wanted to include them in all the good times I was having and let them know maybe for the first time in my life I, I felt like content and really happy in where I was in the world. Then he ends with, that's all for now, don't miss me too much. I've hit the jackpot and going to continue riding this wave while I'm on it. I've been mesmerized for years now at my good fortune. It's almost a spiritual experience. Then he ends with, uh, text me, your one and only Jimmy. I come from a blue collar background, very working class background, which I am grateful for. It instilled a great work ethic in me. He was in a good place. He was at work. He was doing really good. He was so upbeat about it. He liked the challenge. It was a sales position. This is James with Backlog Cars. And he was top guy month after month. 911 for medics for fire. Yes, uh, a traffic accident, motorcycle just got hit. It's okay. really bad, really bad. The, okay. the, the motorcycle rider is really hurt. Yeah, I'm a witness. Okay. I had to stop really quickly or I would have ran into the truck and the bike didn't make it. Just almost went through a glass window, but praise God he did it. I remember everything that day. I was on the, the Pacific Coast Highway going northbound, and everything was normal. I was just cruising. There was a green light ahead of me, and as I was approaching the green light, the next thing I knew, there was a semi truck just turning left right in front of me. I thought I was dead. I thought I was going to T bone the truck. I thought it was over. Next thing I know, I'm flying through the air. I crash through some wooden signs, and uh, then I'm laying on my back, and I'm staring at the sky. I was just parked at the Circle K getting some coffee this morning. 
I have a dash cam in the truck, and I believe it just caught the incident. I could tell by other people's reactions to around me that it was bad. I think I might have laid there for about maybe 20 minutes, bleeding out, not fully knowing the extent of my injury. I believe the first surgery that day was like nine hours to clean up the wounds and try to fix it as best they could. They, they, they told me to call somebody, so I, I just called my friend to let him know that I wouldn't be coming into work that day. I, uh, I messed up my ankle. Again, just, I, I just wanted to under, underplay it and not worry anybody. The phone rings, sir, about 8 o'clock in the morning. I picked the phone up and I listened to the voicemail on there. It was Jim talking on her and he had got an accident, you know, he downplayed it. I'm okay, hurt my ankle a little bit, you know, he doesn't want nobody to worry. And um, that's how that became, how I found out. Hey guys, it's Jimmy. Got some bad news. I got in a motorcycle accident yesterday. I'm okay, it's my, uh, it's really just my ankle. But uh, don't worry, I'm fine. I called him and said, uh, that was a little motorcycle accident. Um, no big deal, uh, I'm fine. I'll talk to you later or something like that. Um, and then next thing I know, they were there, my parents and my, my aunt. Then we flew out there and when I saw him, I couldn't believe it. The leg is all wrapped up and it had fixators on it that this hardware poking out and because they couldn't, there was no cast, they couldn't put a cast on it. It was all open wounds, you know, like just blown open. He had kidney failure at this point. He was bloated and didn't look good. My right foot was turning black at the edges, so they wanted to get blood that direction to restore life, basically, my, my dying foot. The amputation happened one week after the accident. I just wanted to be back to normal as soon as possible. He's always trying to be strong and has this facade of this macho, got it all together guy, but you know, he, he went through some mentally, some hard, hard stuff. You know, I, I cried every day. A part of me died and a part of me was violently ripped away from me. Yeah, it, it transcends a physical sense. It's, I missed my foot, I missed my leg. I used to apologize to my leg. I said, I'm sorry this happened to you, I'm sorry this happened. We'll, we'll make it better though. The sooner I, I faced the pain and dealt with it, this, the sooner I would overcome it. So I got off all the medication they gave me and I just started working out. I want to get my strength back. I went to rehab a few times. They taught me some pointers, some movements I can do, which I still employ to this day in my movements. I just started fixing myself because I, I felt I was the only person that could do that. Well, I'm so proud of how he's handled himself with the injury and not letting up on being healthy, eating healthy, and exercising and working out because I know it's hard to get up and go work out and go run or do lift weights and things like that, but he feels like he's got to be strong. It's for his lifetime to ensure, you know, when he's in his 70s and 80s, he can, you know, still be not a burden to anybody. I can bend down, but I really can't crouch down. 
I don't know if there's any way to resolve that. Just dealing with the leg, the, the, the stump. If it doesn't remain the same girth, which it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's, it constantly wants to expand. And so it's a constant battle of keeping the stump a certain size. If I don't wear a compression sock or the leg for a day, I won't be able to put my prosthetic leg on. Sometimes I'll sleep with a compression sock on to keep the residual limb at, at the right size it needs to be. If I sweat, then it doesn't want to fit right. It'll start shifting and the, the leg can just shift on me. There's blistering, there's irritation. I have to wear it pretty much all day because, again, if I take it off long enough, my prosthetic, then it won't go back in. So it's a constant battle. In one word, it feels electric. There's always a, a low electrical current in the stump. I feel it right now. Every day, five, seven times a day, uh, sudden shooting electric shocks, like somebody is, uh, has a taser and uh, tasering my, my residual limb. It can be quite debilitating. I'll groan in pain. Um, it happens totally at random. He, he does have pain. He's got back pain, though he doesn't complain about it. He gets cortisone in his spine to, to alleviate the back pain, and he gets phantom pains, even though that's diminished somewhat. He's got bone spurs now as an outgrowth of maybe the tissue or the bone, the remnants, and those hurt. And the one tibia, I think it is, that's really almost looks like it's poking out through the skin almost. That it's red, and, and sometimes the stump will, will start to bleed if because he's got a lot of bad scarring. I worry about his back, and is he going to have back problems from it? Is he going to get? rheumatoid arthritis, and what's in his future? Can he keep up this pace as he gets older? And what about, you know, meeting a, a woman and getting married and having kids? You know, there's all kinds of things that and it's a big unknown. Finding a significant other, I think it can be intimidating for a, a, a woman to deal with somebody in my condition that they'd potentially have to be a pseudo caregiver, that I'm not a complete man, that I'm handicapped. I don't consider myself handicapped, but I know at the same time that I am, but I, I pretend that I'm not. I don't know how a woman might see, maybe she might see it as a handicap and be intimidated by committing to somebody with a condition like myself. My way of life, my leg was suddenly and, and, and violently torn away from me. You know, that's how I look at it. There's no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It was traumatic. It's given me pain, grief. I probably should have been dead. I think another inch or two I think I could be dead. I wouldn't be here right now. So knowing that, that my life comes down to an inch is very profound and gives me, it gives me sadness, but it gives me more pride, I think, knowing that I did survive. <laughs>